If your school experience was anything like mine, then your formal education did nothing to prepare you for financial success later in life. However, there are four critical financial habits that you need to learn about if you don't want to make mistakes in your young adulthood. I was an economics and finance major in undergrad, worked at a credit card company for four years, and recently graduated with my master's in business administration. And here are my four critical financial habits for young adults. The first important habit is to start using credit cards. Not only are credit cards extremely useful from a purchasing perspective, but the critical thing they do is that they help start building your credit history and credit score. Your credit score, sometimes called FICO score, is a number from 300 to 850 that represents your trustworthiness to creditors or lenders the money. A higher score represents a higher ability and trustworthiness to pay back money, so the higher your score, the more likely that creditors will also lend money to you. The reason why accessing credit or loans is so important is because throughout your life, you'll probably need to borrow large amounts of money to make important purchases. These purchases could be something like a college education, a home, or a car, so each of these things could also drastically alter your life. Landlords might also request your credit score when determining if they want to rent out their unit to you or not. Borrowing money comes at a cost though, which is called interest. For example, a bank might lend you $100, but then tell you that you need to pay $110 back in a year's time. This extra $10 that you pay here is called interest, and is the cost of borrowing that money over that amount of time. The higher your credit score is, the lower that interest might be, so instead of paying $10, you might only need to pay $5. So a high credit score is important not only to access lenders' money, but also to reduce the interest that you have to pay on that borrowed amount. When you end up borrowing half a million or a million dollars across your lifetime, saving on interest could literally be the difference between tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's important to start using credit cards as soon as possible because increasing your credit score is a long process that takes many years to build up. Using credit cards and paying them on time is one of the few reliable ways that you can actually increase your credit score. So in the beginning, you'll have to apply for starter credit cards that accept low credit scores and those who are still in the process of building their history. Discover and Capital One are two companies that are known for being starter credit cards and also offer student offerings like their Discover It Student Cashback and Saver One Student cards. The Discover It card offers 5% cash back on rotating categories every three months, which are usually pretty expansive categories like Amazon purchases or gas stations. The Saver One offers 3% cash back on other desirable categories like restaurants, streaming services, and groceries. And it offers relatively high reward multipliers in these categories, which is fantastic for a student card or starter card. Both these cards can remain a useful part of your wallet long after you graduate from low scores in student cards as well. And if for some reason your credit scores are already high enough, feel free to try to apply for normal versions in order to get less restrictions of potentially higher credit lines. As you can tell from these examples, using credit cards in themselves can also be quite lucrative from all the rewards you get through spending with them. Improving your credit score means access to even higher tiers of credit cards and rewards, so this is another reason to start using credit cards early. Eventually, you'll be able to access the premium cards like the American Express Platinum, the Chase Sapphire Reserve, or the Capital One Venture X, and these can give you access to luxury perks like airport lounges, hotel status, and discounted first class air Fair. Truly mastering the credit card game can potentially earn you thousands or even tens of thousands of dollars per year. A word of warning though, credit cards can also start losing you a lot of money if you rack up a balance on them and don't pay them off in time every month. If you only pay the minimum amount the credit card requires, then the leftover balance starts accruing interest of up to 30% a year. This instantly negates the 2-3% you might be earning in rewards and makes credit cards totally not worth spending with. So to use credit cards effectively, you have to pay off the full balance each month every month. If you can't do this, don't spend the money, it's that simple. The second habit is to only buy ETFs. Note that this habit only applies if you're in a position with enough savings to invest in the stock market. So as always, use your own judgment and do your own research before investing in anything. If you do have long-term money to invest, the stock market is one of the quickest and easiest ways to grow that long-term cash. It earns much more money than parking your savings in a bank account or investing in money market or CDs. But of course, the risk is greater too. So what is an ETF or exchange traded fund? ETFs are shares that can be bought and sold just like your normal stock, but instead of representing one company, it's a whole portfolio of companies. This way, your investment is diversified, so if one company does poorly, it's very likely another company will do better and offset those losses. But you might ask, why not just go all in on one stock that you really believe in? Well, true, if that stock goes way up, you'll be doing really well, but the likelihood is that it's not going to and you'll be exposing yourself to a lot of unnecessary risk. But then why won't this happen, you might ask? It's because there's very little chance that your faith in this stock is based on exclusive knowledge that only you have and that others haven't thought of before. 
imagine there's thousands of professionals out there and AI algorithms that you're competing with when you're betting on whether a certain stock will go up or down. What are the chances that you really know better than them versus you're just falling victim to a bias that you have? And even the pros don't get it right most of the time. My finance professors in business school love to tell us all the time how these professional fund managers did no better at choosing stocks than monkeys throwing darts at a dartboard. Don't let your stock investments lose to a monkey. On average, it can be assumed that any stock is fairly priced and represents all of the available public knowledge out there. But still, I might not have you convinced on why you shouldn't just YOLO on everything. After all, no risk, no reward, right? Well, it turns out that choosing individual stocks is even mathematically proven to be too much risk for too little reward. Without going too much into exact mathematical detail, the idea is that every stock has two sources of risk systematic risk and specific risk. Specific risks are tied to a singular company while systematic risks are tied to the macroeconomic condition overall and affect all companies. Financial mathematicians and academics figured out a long time ago that diversifying your investments allows you to maximize your returns while minimizing your risks. Specifically, diversifying can't get rid of your exposure to systematic risks, but it can in theory eliminate all of your specific risks. That's why it's unwise to invest in individual stocks. You get a return, but it comes with both systematic and specific risk. On the other hand, diversified investments like ETFs can give you that comparable return while only exposing you to systematic risk. Some of the top ETFs worth considering out there include SPY, QQQ, and VTI. Even if some ETFs might be country or industry specific, they at the minimum still allow you to be invested in a wide range of companies. The third financial habit mainly applies for when you start working, but it's to start saving for your retirement through your employer's 401k plan or your own IRA. The specific terminology I use here only applies for those living in the United States, but saving for your retirement would be a wise thing to do for anyone in the world. 401ks and IRA are investment accounts where you can invest money in stocks, bonds, and ETFs to access for when you retire. This essentially means that the money in these accounts are locked away until you're 60 because withdrawing from them early will incur large penalties. 401ks are funded when you elect to have a percentage of your paycheck each pay period withheld to be placed within one of these investment accounts. IRAs are retirement accounts that you can add your own money into at any time similar to a bank account or brokerage account, but there are also limits that are set by the US government on how much you can add per year. The question becomes, of course, why would I lock away money that I can't use until I retire? Why not put that money into just a normal investment account and have the possibility of using it now? These are all valid questions, of course, and if your financial situation isn't that strong, it might actually be a good idea to use that money now instead of locking away for the future. But if you have goals of retiring and are in the financial position to start saving some money, it would be extremely wise to do so. This is because contributions to your 401k and IRA have extreme tax benefits that will save you immense amounts of money in taxes, potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars over the course of your whole life. So how do these benefits work and how do you start saving on taxes? First off, depending on your employer, your company might have a program where they'll match your contributions to your 401k. This means that if you elect to contribute 4% to your 401k, your employer could match this 4% amount as well, and this exact percentage will be dependent on your company. Even in this illustrative example, this is effectively a 4% salary increase. And for that 4% investment you made, you instantly made a 100% return. This dwarfs any expected return you can get from the stock market by magnitude already. Not only this, but you can also also decide to pay taxes on your 401k or IRA before putting it in, and this is called a Roth 401k or Roth IRA. The advantage of paying taxes now is that from then on, all the investments in those IRA or 401k accounts can grow tax-free and you won't have to pay any capital gains tax when you withdraw from those retirement accounts. On the other hand, you can also elect to do a traditional IRA or 401k plan. This allows you to contribute money into your retirement accounts without paying any taxes and only pay taxes on that money after you withdraw it. Given that you are young and your career trajectory is on the way up, it's usually smarter to take the Roth route and pay taxes now. This way, you avoid paying taxes in the future when you'll likely be at a higher tax bracket. In either case, you save massive amounts on taxes because you either avoid paying some of it or you delay paying a portion of it while it makes money for 
you. Given that income taxes in the US are somewhere between 10 and 35%, even on the low end, just the tax savings themselves would rapidly outpace the gains you would have made had you just invested in the stock market. So if your financial situation can afford it now, not only is it wise to invest for your future retirement, but there are also massive financial benefits to doing so. Rest assured, in the case that you have a medical emergency, plan to buy a house, or plan to pay for some school tuition, you can still use the funds in your account with limited or no penalty. The last habit I have for y'all is to keep all liquid funds you need in a high interest bearing checking account. You'll always need cash on hand to pay your monthly and near term expenses like your rent or credit card bills. In this case, it'd be ill advised to keep these funds in the stock market which can constantly go up and down and so you don't want to be caught in a position where you have to pay near term bills when the market is on a downswing. However, cash just laying around doesn't make any money either, especially for a lot of these checking accounts out there which have abysmal or no interest rates at all. This has recently changed though with the rise of interest rates worldwide. Now there are tons of products out there to save your money with that effectively act as checking accounts and also have interest rates of up to 5% per year. This is an incredibly high return for effectively no risk while also maintaining access to your liquid funds. These accounts are more commonly called cash management accounts, but for all intents and purposes are basically checking accounts in function. This means that you can hold and store your money for free, have ATM access, pay bills from your account, or set up direct deposit, and also connect to apps like PayPal and Venmo. The liquidity and feature set is what differentiates cash management accounts from other things like high yield savings accounts, which often have comparable interest rates, but many more restrictions, which makes them not worth it for me personally. Two good options out there are the Fidelity Cash Management account and Vanguard Cash Plus account. I personally love and use the Fidelity Cash Management account because being on the Fidelity platform, it easily integrates with the whole brokerage environment in case you also want to manage stocks on the same account or in case you have your retirement accounts with Fidelity as well. On top of that, Fidelity is a large established financial player and so you have robust customer support and you won't have to worry about the business collapsing anytime soon, unlike potentially some of these smaller players that are trying to get into the cash management account space. For Fidelity, the annual interest rate on cash just parked in the account is actually 2.7%. So in order to hit that 5%, you'll actually need to move your money into a money market fund. Money market funds aren't FDIC insured, unlike bank balances. But the truth is, their risk profile is almost exactly the same since money markets are mostly invested in US treasuries, and the word of the US treasury is what's backing the FDIC insurance. So it's extremely unlikely that you'll lose money investing in money markets, even in poorer economic situations. An awesome feature of Fidelity's cash management account that mitigates this need to buy money market funds is that anything invested in money markets are treated as liquid cash, so you don't have to sell and wait for it to settle in order to use that money. This means that every time you pay a bill, make an ATM withdrawal, or send money on Venmo, it just directly subtracts that balance from your money market funds. An extra trick that I use is that I invest in funds that are completely comprised of US Treasury bonds like FDLXX. This way, the interest that you earn are exempt from state taxes, which might range from 4 to 11%, making the effective return on this cash even higher for money that's usually just sitting around doing nothing. This is where you want to store your emergency funds, which is also a very smart thing to have. I know I covered a lot in this video, and each individual topic is honestly worth a video and research session in itself. However, I hope this video gave you ideas on how you can get started on building great financial habits and improving this aspect of your life. For more self-improvement ideas, check out my other videos and let me know down below below if you have any other cool financial tips.